Hello and welcome to a very special Subspench. We're here with a new series uh, to hopefully entertain you during the lockdown, uh, where I'm sure you're all missing football and sport in general uh, quite a lot. And of course, uh, I've been missing my old friend Richard Latham as well, who's amazingly, uh, with the technology, managed to join me on FaceTime. Uh, it's, you're not normally good with the old technical bits, but you've managed to achieve this so far, Richard. So you've learned something during lockdown, clearly. I'm absolutely hopeless at technical things like this, but I have got a son. <laughs> <laughs> and he uh, turns everything on and off for me and then does everything else in between and uh, so, so I, I get by like that but so, yeah, good to see you, you're looking not so bad Thank you, well I'm, I'm trying to grow a beard to look a little bit like you but I think it might take a while Well you've always wanted to emulate me <laughs> one, one more way. <laughs> Clearly, and, and I ought to give a shout out also to Dave Ramsey, big Bristol Rovers fan who normally cuts what little hair I have. I'm sure he's very frustrated at the moment, but hope to see you soon, uh, Dave, as well. Uh, Richard, OK, um, let's talk some serious things. What we should tell people is that coming up in the show, uh, we're going to be hearing some memories of uh, interviews we've done before with Ian Holloway. Uh, you, you get on really well with him, I know. Uh, the City Rovers thing comes into play, so we'll be finding out what Ian thought about his early days at Rovers and also talking to Terry Cooper um, about uh, facing Brazil in the 1970 World Cup, which, incidentally, the, that game was shown by the BBC, wasn't it, right at the start of lockdown? Um, it's quite interesting to see that again. A great game that was. So, so that's all coming up on the show now, but uh, Richard... Um, Obviously, we've both been a little idle during lockdown because there's nothing nothing to report on. Uh, where do you see the situation at the moment, particularly regarding City and Rovers? Do you think we're ever going to finish this season? I think we might even find there are different categories because, to me, that it's quite obvious that if, if um, the, the Premier League clubs and maybe the Championship clubs as well are in a better position to, to combat what's going on than the lower division clubs. And when you start talking about playing games behind closed doors... That's not such a great problem to the bigger clubs because their gate money is, is not is only a fraction of their income. But when you talk about, I mean, Ian Holloway, you mentioned, he's at Grimsby Town now. Uh, and I talked to Ian quite a lot. And very early on when this was happening, he said, if we lose even three home games towards the end of the season with the gate money, you know, our cash flow is affected. You know, top clubs like us are going to find it very hard to survive. And that was weeks or even a month or two ago so now we're in this situation where we still don't know whether the season's going to um, continue I, I, I read more and more that managers and chairman in the lower divisions are starting to think it won't continue for them and I think that might well be the case because playing behind closed doors doesn't make a lot of sense to me for, the, for clubs the size of Grimsley even Bristol Rovers you know if you're getting less than 10,000 gates you know they, they may be getting those gates but, they, but they're, that's everything to them you know, yeah. to play behind closed doors, you get all the expenses involved and, and, and no gate money. So when you talk about them compared to a Liverpool or a Manchester United, who, who as I say, their gate money is a fraction of their earnings over a year, um, they, yeah, they can play behind closed doors. They can put their players up in hotels for six weeks if that's what it takes to isolate them, you know, and then play with nobody in the ground. Um, and if they want to finish the season, I know you're a Liverpool fan, so you, 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 try, you, you, you want them to finish the season. Uh, I'm an Everton fan, so I don't. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I think that the Premier League is a different kettle of fish. And I, I, could, I could see the Premier League season finishing and maybe the Championship season. I'm not so sure about the lower divisions. I, I think it's with every day and week that goes by, it's less likely that the EFL season will be completed. Yeah, I agree. There was this, this supposed uh, leak of uh, conversation that Alex Rodman, the Rovers PFA uh, delegate, was uh, involved in, uh, where he, he said that they've been apparently been talking about no spectators before January next year. Well, uh, clearly... Rovers, £24 million in debt, that was announced just before lockdown, wasn't it? And they, they can't afford to play games and get no income, can they? Well, that's exactly, that's exactly the point I made, yeah. and they're not the only club in that position in, in the lower division. There's, there's smaller clubs with bigger debts, probably. Um, and people, I don't think, have taken into account just what's involved in starting the season again. Not just choosing a date when it's safe, but choosing a date... And then deciding what is safe. So, do you put you put the players in a hotel for six weeks and keep them in quarantine, you know, and keep everyone away from them, keep them away from their families? What What about a player who maybe has got an elderly mother living with with the, with the family, or or you know, young children, whatever? You've got to make sure the first thing is absolutely that they're safe. Yeah. And, and, and the people around them are safe. So where does that start and end? You know, there's so much would have to go into. I think the the, the P uh, sorry the yeah the um, Premier League have, have, have already started a sort of project return or something, whatever that might be. And and you you start to read the things that are involved, and you think, well, you know, that's a huge, huge operation. And again, for maybe the bigger clubs, 
it, it can work out. I don't think the lower league clubs are going to want to put set foot hotel bills and no. and all the sort of thing to keep their players quarantined. It, it just doesn't make any sense. So uh, I'm more and more of the opinion that, um, as I say, that the EFL season may well. Not, I, you know, we've lost the conference. I think the conference is finished. I see today. I think it was the academy leagues have, have, have now announced that they're finishing the season. The central league, a reserve league. Uh, has announced no more fixtures this season. So it's really only the, the top level of the game now that's left to, to the, with, with the possibility of continuing the season. And the lower down that you go, I think it makes it, it makes there's so much involved that it would be more sensible to start fresh. Yeah, it's all pretty gloomy, isn't it? Uh, neutral venues, the only way the Premier League can uh, finish, apparently. And I saw Sergio Aguero quoted as saying, well, he's not sure he wants to play uh, if it's not safe because he might bring it back to his family. So uh, yeah. that's, that's one of those things. We'll maybe talk a little bit more so about some of the other sports in a minute, but uh, uh, we want to get away from some of the doom and gloom, don't we? Let's talk to um, uh, our friend Ian Holloway. Uh, we spoke to him uh, the first programme of the series we did for the Bristol Post, didn't we, back, back in... Uh, the autumn of 2018, um, and Oli, it had to be a two-part program because he talks so well, doesn't he? Um, Not uh, so much. <laughs> and we we know he bleeds blue blue blood, um, but it, uh, it was particularly interesting what he told us about uh, Gordon Bennett because Gordon Bennett was the director of youth. You may remember at, uh, at Bristol Rovers when um, Ian Holloway and a bunch of those players were were coming to the fore, and uh, these were Ian's memories of those days with Gordon Bennett. What he cared about was not just rumours, he cared about our futures. So if we weren't on it or at it, he would make sure that we were. And if not, he would discard us because he never, uh, there was only two apprentices who never got to pros. We were never promised it, but he only, he made sure that if we were good enough, that he would make sure that we carried on with his. So I was part of, of, a, of a, you know, who created Gary Mabber. You know, yeah. Gary Mabber, the difference between me and Gary and Kevin and, you know what I mean? It was. Kevin was so flamboyant, was, Mabs was one of us, he was working hard, do you know what I mean, whereas Kev was a bit, you know, a bit Jack the Lad, you know, he was a great player, fantastic player, but it was, mm. it was all a bit, you know, so Mabs really, for us, was like, look at him, he went to Tottenham and, yeah. and Gordon drove us up there, we saw his, his, his first game against um, Glasgow Rangers for him and he scored a brilliant volley, you know, and all the way back, Gordon. You did you see that? This is what you can do. You, you know what I mean? Because he wanted us all to. The Bristol Rovers traded on this, didn't they? Yeah. As the sort of lesser team in Bristol, in, in in not in terms of ability, or but in terms of not having as much resources. Careful what you're saying. <laughs> not, in terms of, <laughs> not in terms of ability, but in careful. terms of resources. Be... Ian. <laughs> but uh, what I was going to say, and, and because they traded on it. You were probably underdogs for most of the derby games in, in which you played in, and yet you had an incredible run, uh, which I remember very well, of something like 11 games against City where you didn't lose, and you either won or drew against them. And I know very well because you used to find me after most of them to, re to remind me about it. But you did have a great record in local derbies, didn't you, when you were playing? Yeah, unfortunately, in a minute, I, I met a supporter the other day. Who, they were having an 18th birthday party because that's 18 years in a row that City have been well above Rovers, you know, so, but in my time that wasn't the case, you know, and I was fortunate that the squad that we had actually cared and listened, so anybody who came from Scotland or like Jock, you know, Ian Alexander or, or Devon White, I'd, we'd be at them, you know, the Bristolians be at them, hey, you come, you know what I mean, because it meant that much to me, and that's what I felt Rovers gave me, they gave me an ownership of the badge of what it should mean and what it how you should feel about doing it and I just tried to spread that to everyone else and that know? culminated in the 1989-90 season yeah. both teams at the top of the league yeah. I'm sure every Rovers fan will want me to mention was it May the 2nd 1990 yeah. uh, Twerton Park 3-0 victory over City suddenly you're going to win the championship and they aren't and um, what do you remember of that night well I remember they had four chances to do it before they played us or was it three um and they blew every one of them. They were they had a fantastic team that year, you know, absolutely fantastic team without a shadow of a doubt. Some brilliant players, um, Walshie and Taylor and God knows what. But we felt we had a chance because they had a chance to do it when we weren't playing. They didn't do it, then they didn't do it, and then they had to play us. So the night before, um, I got phoned up because my, my phone number was in the book and it was Bristol City fans. Some of them. And I refused to put the phone down. They were telling me, we know where you live, your address is in here, we'll burn your house down and all that shit. And, um, excuse me, I should say that, but, <laughs> but I just refused to put the phone down. I was up till half past one in the morning. 
and in the end I just said look you keep doing this I'm going to tell my lads tomorrow and, and you better you better hope I don't tell them anyway first thing Jared can I say something well, I told him about the phone call we were men possessed mate because we all cared for each other so when I had the chance to put that penalty in no way was I going to miss that not in a million years you know but all I remember from that night was the dignity that Joe Jordan showed me that you have to carry as a football manager they lost they lost again and he was he came into our dressing room and congratulated every one of us which I thought was top top drawer you know because that man for me was a, a legend right in the game played for Manchester United Scotland and God knows what and yet in the heat of his most painful defeat that night he still had total class you know which I realized at times with you media people because I was rover so much I didn't you know and it really affected me in a huge way you know and I realized some of the things I've said about City and Rovers and and it's only because I care in a funny way you know people don't realize how proud I am of where I'm from mm. and I don't think my accent has done me any good really to be honest you know if I had a Scots accent some of the things I've done in football might have got a little bit more credence you know because oh what Oh, you know, a bit of a farmer coming in. You know, so, so, so Bristol football is still looked on as a bit of a backwater, oh, is it? Well, the the yeah. minute you get outside of, the minute you get past Swindon, you get a bit higher up. Who did you play for? Well, that's what I couldn't get. When I went to QPR, I couldn't get, I used to get angry. Hey, Bristol Rovers, it's a real good team, and blah, 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 blah. blah. We, what? You'd have thought they would have got it because of Jerry Francis yeah, and everything, wouldn't you? Not at no, all, no. no. Mm. And what I didn't realise is that my world, I need to make mm. bigger. You know what I mean? Because I cared that much. It was like the, every minute of every day, wherever I went, it was like, hang on a minute, I'm going to stand up and fight for Rovers because that's what I believe in. But good God, it's a bigger world, isn't there? So, you know, but the funny thing is we need each other. When Rovers were, were failing a couple of years ago, and Darrell's done brilliant to get them back, when they were failing, it affected City. Don't care what, don't care what you say. You need the competition. And the closer they get, the better it's going to be. You know, but at the minute... Rovers have got to try and catch up to them because they are really, you know, with the ground and what what um, they've done is is not annoying. Well done to them, but it, you know, from the other side, it's a little bit of a, whoa, you know, why ain't we getting that? Yeah. Ian Holloway, there, what a character! Uh, I've met uh, quite a few characters in my time covering Bristol football, and Ian ranks right up there. Uh, one of the most bubbly, enthusiastic characters. Absolutely lives, breathes football. And a, a fantastic guy. I'm very interested to see what he said about Joe Jordan there. And Joe, a very different type of character. Um, uh, more quiet and reserved than, than, than Ian. But uh, interesting that, that these people who played at the top level, they do have that bit of class about them. And, and I think Ian's... I was very gracious of Ian to say he learned that night from Joe and has probably taken some of the things late into his later career because he did used to be absolutely mm. incorrigible. I mean, after Derby games, he used to come up to me and find me after every Derby game that because I was covering Bristol City for the Post and uh, he would find me after every Derby game. There was about 11 that Rovers went unbeaten. And, and, and at some point in the evening, I would show up hear this, hello, Rich, we did you again, mate. <laughs> we did you again. And it would be Ollie. And uh, we somehow managed to overcome that. And I uh, became really good friends outside of uh, the, uh, outside of uh, a professional relationship. And of course, he's he, he's back home now in his, his home near Bath. Um, lockdown has been living up in Grimsby, and I've been in regular touch with him because I go to write his column for the for the Bristol Post, which has intentionally been suspended. And we hope we'll be back soon. But yeah. uh, great lad. Um, yeah, we, we, we hope uh, we'll all be back to, to normal fairly soon, of course. But uh, before the end of the programme, we'll just have a, a quick word about uh, maybe how cricket and boxing have been affected by the lockdown as well. But I think now uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit about Leeds United. And, and the reason we'll talk about Leeds United is because, of course, Terry Cooper, uh, the uh, famous England international, came to first play and then manage Bristol Rovers and then of course took over at Ashton Gate against Bristol City. Um, some fantastic stories to tell but I'm sure Terry would have been particularly sad in the last couple of weeks as we all were to hear of the the loss of Norman Hunter uh, and then more recently Trevor Cherry as well so um, some of the great names of the uh, that great Leeds United team have, uh, have sadly passed, passed uh, during this uh, this lockdown. It's a terrible shame isn't it Richard? Yes, when Norman Hunter uh, passed away, um, the Bristol Post contacted me to, to try and get some tributes to him from people who played with him. And of course, one of the first person I went to was Terry. And uh, he, of course, lives in Tenerife. 
Um, and I phoned his home and his wife said he's in hospital. And I said, oh, goodness, because he has had his cancer problems over the years, Terry, and quite badly. And I thought, oh, no, you know, something's gone wrong there. But thankfully, it was for a hip, hip replacement operation. And she said, oh, you can ring him in hospital. Typically, TC picked up the, the, his mobile phone in, in minutes, even though it was a sad subject we were talking about. We were talking about old times. And, and he, he, as I've said many times, was the, was the had the best sense of humour of any manager I ever worked with and often had me in fits and giggles when I used to ring him from the, from the evening post office every, every morning. Um, and he was in good nick, I'm um, glad to report. So what we did, of course, he was very saddened by the de uh, demise of uh, Norman. Uh, and, and so were we all because I remember watching Norman play for Bristol City and I remember when he came down, we all thought we'd signed this kicker, you know, who kicks people and, and he's a really hard man and all that. But what a good footballer he was, brilliant left foot, you talk about left foots playing for Bristol the other years, Alan Walsh comes to mind. Norman Hanks had a fantastic left foot, would take free kick, could do anything. And uh, Terry and I talked about him, and Terry came up as, as always with some great stories about uh, Norman and how they used to play table tennis and snooker together when they were at Leeds, and, and Norman would never go home until he'd won a game. <laughs> Terry, Terry said I was crap at snooker, but I was good at table tennis, and he kept me out until I playing table tennis until he won a game. And, it was, and they had that sort of relationship, good friendly relationship. And it is always sad. That was a great lead side. A lot of people maligned it because they were thought to be a bit, not dirty, but, but uh, if you like, streetwise uh, ahead of that when that was a, not a compliment, if you like, you know, that they knew how to handle referees and how to handle everything uh, around the, the game. But they were a great, great team with some great players. And, and Terry always said Norman was good enough to be a midfield player or even an inside forward. He had that much ability. And of course, he would have played much more for England had it not been that he was around at the same time as a certain Bobby Moore. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, anyway, um, back well, about four years ago now, something like that, we, uh, you spoke to him, didn't you, in the dugout at Swindon Town, I seem to remember. Um, uh, you spoke a lot about the Bristol City days, but then you constantly... Yeah, we'd, we'd already been through that on some sense before, of course. Yeah. So, so this, this time, I thought it'd be great to talk to Terry about his fantastic international career. In your day, I mean, you, you did play against the cream of the world's players. I mean, in that one World Cup, you played against Pele, for goodness sake, Jazino in, in, in the Brazilian game, didn't you? Yeah. played against West Germany, obviously. Um, just just briefly, what was it like to play against Pele, Jazino, those sort of players? Frightening. <laughs> <laughs> I can remember, you know, when the buzzer went, we played in, um, where did we play? Guadalajara. It was 100 degrees, 12 o'clock kickoff for television. Um, they're all... The buzz is gone and uh, y you come out in the corridor and line up, you know, and I, I forgot where I was anyway. When I've looked, I, 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 I've looked across and behold, it's Pelly. <laughs> and, uh, you know, like I've looked at him and he's, he's about the same size as me, five, seven, and five, eight. And uh, I've looked, I thought, Jesus, he's a big boy, him. I mean, his thighs were twice the size of mine. And I thought, if I run into him, I'm in trouble today. And he looked at me and he said to me, in broken, I got all the best Cooper. And I go, oh, Pally's talking to me, like, you know. <laughs> and uh, so we've gone out and then I'm playing against that Jazzy. You know, I've looked at him, he was about three inches bigger than me, twice as broad. And I thought, God, I've got a job on here today. So in them days, the first one tackle was free, wasn't it? So the first time he's got the ball, I've given, try, I've rattled him and I've bounced off him and he's come and started laughing at me. And I thought, oh, God. So the next time I've got, he's hit me, hasn't he? And knocked me down. I thought, you know, you think, my God. And every one of them were really, they were more like rugby players, but toned, you know? Uh, and I have to say, that's the best team I've ever, ever seen, I think. In every position, they were proper individual players, but played as a team, you know? Mm. Fantastic. And we, we thought we had a good team then. Um, well, we did have a, a good team. We played quite well against them as well. And if you remember, bless him, Jeff Astle came on as a sub, and he and the chance dropped to him as soon as he'd come on. And he's, I mean, Jeff was a great finisher, and he he, he put it wide. Or we'd have got a draw against them. Yeah, uh, but there were some. I mean, there was some team. Mm. I mean, the best team I've ever seen. People yeah. hoped that would be the final, didn't they, that year? Yeah. And it, it all went wrong from two 0 up against well, West Germany. Yeah, but you know, people blamed uh, Alf Ramsey, but. What he, he was trying to arrest Bobby Charlton uh, because he knew that uh, before kickoff, he, you know, he said to us, "Look," he said, "They're terrified of, of Bobby Charlton. They'll man mark him with Beckenbauer, and they did. So wherever Bobby, we played ten against ten, but Bobby, you know, we said to Bobby, "Take Beckenbauer out on the left or the right wing, keep him out there," um, and he did, and we went two up. 
because we had the better players then because their best player, Beckenbauer, was man marking Charlton, would probably our best player. Uh, but then when Alf substituted him, he freed him up, he freed Beckenbauer up, and then he started to probe, and you know, and then the fluke to goal, it Uwe Seeler on the back of his head somewhere and flew in the top corner, you think. Um, and Peter Bonetti drived over one, bless him. Um, uh, went extra time and, you know, they had the upper hand and got the winner, mm. which was really disappointing because I thought we'd go all the way. Mm. I didn't think we'd beat Brazil in the final, if I'm honest. We'd have had a go, but but uh, I thought we'd have... Uh, you know, if we'd have seen that West Germany game out, we'd have definitely got to the final. These days, Terry, you'd, you'd be a, probably a multi-millionaire if you played at the top level as long as you did. Are you glad you played in the era you did play in? Yeah, I wouldn't. I don't think I. I don't think I'd change it. I mean, when I played, uh, television was just coming in, and they had one camera, so the camera concentrated on the ball. I mean, they didn't see what we were doing off the ball, but now if you sneeze. It's all referred back, isn't it? I mean, some of the things we got up to, <laughs> you wouldn't believe on the pitch. And uh, with that Leeds team as bad as people made them out. No, no, we were, we were, we were, we could. Uh, we had a great spirit, and if somebody kicked me, I knew the ten others. Had, I didn't have to do it. But that's, there's nothing wrong with that. We got labelled by the Southern Press, I think it was, as dirty Leeds because we kept stuffing Arsenal and Tottenham. Um, in that team, I have to tell you, we had some unbelievably great players. Unbelievable skill factor, you know. I mean, Norman Hunter was a left-sided centre back, uh, but he had the ability of an inside forward. In fact, if he'd been at any other club, uh, he'd, have, he'd have probably been in midfield. But we had Giles and Bremner, and so and uh, uh, so he made Norman a left back. I mean, I came as a left winger, uh, and he converted me to left back. You'd be a wing back these days, wouldn't you? Oh, I'd be fantastic. Mm. I'd be sensational. <laughs> oh my God, honestly. I would, I would I, if I could wave a magic wand and I was 27 year old again and I could play just one game as a wing back. God blimey. Well, the incorrigible Terry Cooper there, and I'm sure he would be an absolutely fantastic wing back in the in the current day. He had a fantastic left foot. Again, another of the, the uh, uh, old games that's been played during the lockdown was the League Cup final of uh, 1968, I think, when he scored the winner against Arsenal, left foot into the roof of the net at Wembley. So, yeah, I, I totally agree. He, he was a great player, wasn't he? He was a wing back in all ways, the, the, the name, because he, he was such a fantastic player going forward. He had the skills of a winger, uh, as well as the, the um, skills of tackling and needed for, for defending. So, uh, as he says, um, maybe not quite as <laughs> not quite as enthusiastic as he was about how good he'd be, but, but uh, yeah, he, it would have suited him down to the ground that position. Yeah, almost time for us to go, Richard. But uh, I know you love cricket, and you actually that's your your job during the summer, isn't it, covering cricket? And obviously, there's been. Nothing Nothing so far, I can't remember, I, apart from the war years, I don't suppose that it's ever been like this. And I, in fact, I think we probably did play a little bit during the war, but they can't play at all at the moment. What, what's going to happen with the cricket, do you think? I know the hundred's been uh, put back till next year, hasn't it? Which actually yeah. is a great shame from my point of view. But uh, I, my, my, my grief over the hundred being put back knows no bounds. <laughs> if, you believe, if you believe that, you believe anything, because I, I consider an extraordinary idea doomed to failure. But anyway, uh, that's, that's by the by. Um, Cricket season as a whole, when will it start? Well, can it start? I imagine if it does start at all, maybe let's we'll say we're talking about August or even mid-August, um, they'd try to play T20, I suppose, because that, that, is the, that is the competition that brings in the money and generates the crowds. But then again, you've got the problem of getting crowds in. Do you, do you, do you play county championship cricket behind closed doors or do you play T20? Do you wait and play T20? Cricket with a with huge crowd, with, you know, massive crowd. So I don't know. I, the answer is nobody knows what's going to happen. They're all, uh, you know, all the clubs and players as they are in football are at home and in, in isolation. Obviously, I've spoken to Richard Dawson at um, Gloucestershire, Jason Kerr at um, Somerset. Um, all of them very frustrated. Gloucestershire in particular, because they were going into the first division of the Championship for the first time in years. You know, a terrifically exciting time having won promotion. They don't get a lot of that Gloucester, I always think. You know, I mean, they have the wonderful, those wonderful glory years in, in, when they won the one day competitions. But uh, over recent times, I don't think they, they've had the rub of the green in a lot of ways. And, and suddenly to win promotion, have everybody excited about I mean, I love the county championship and the fact that they would be playing Somerset again in two derby games during, during the 
championship season was fantastic. And just when all that is, is coming together for them, and, and they had a really good team last season, really good season, Richard Dawson I've got an immense amount of time for, um, you know, suddenly all that is, is put on ice. And, and, you know, whether it be quite as exciting when it does start again, we, we shall have to wait and see. I spoke to Chris Dent, you know, the captain, and he, he said, you know, we were all right up for it. You know, this, this was going to be the, you know, getting to the top, top flight, which we were aiming to do for ages, take on the top players prove ourselves, which I'm, I'm sure every confidence they would have done. Um, and now it's all just, you know, in, in, in abeyance, which is sad. The Somerset, you know, the same, same sort of thing, you know, um, still looking for that elusive first county championship, gone so close so many times since the turn of the century. Uh, and uh, they, they were, again, you know, right up, even though they start the season with a 12-point with a deduction, which obviously is going to make things a bit harder for them after the pitch problems at the end of last season. But uh, they were, again, right up for the season. And here we all are with twiddling our thumbs. I've got no work whatsoever at the, at the moment in terms of cricket. Um, and, you know, what do you do? You can't even write about the game because, you know, until you get sort of teams picked and players in form or out of form, what, what is there to write about, you know, so very sad time for cricket and I suppose, you know, you're your boxing man, aren't you, I suppose it's pretty much the same with boxing. Yeah, within the first couple of days of, um, of the lockdown, uh, I think I lost four gigs, so to speak, of being the MC at boxing shows, both amateur and professional, just one of those things really, um, and personally I can't see how boxing can possibly resume anytime soon because A, you need crowds to pay, uh, to pay for the tickets, for, to pay the boxers, and B, so you can hardly social distance in the middle of a ring, can you? So, and you can you can't have you can't have uh, boxers wearing masks. So it's an impossible situation, just like it is in so many other sports. I feel feel so sorry for uh, a lot of the amateur clubs and also for um, the, the, some of the promoters because uh, okay, the Eddie Hearns of this world are not going to go out of business, are they? It's a, it's a bit like football again. Now, the, the guys at the top will probably be fine, but the uh, the little small hole promoters and the amateur clubs who rely on uh, you know three or four shows a year to uh, for their income, it's just all disappeared, and it's it's all so sad. I think I think the one thing we've got to say on top of all this is sport is sport and life is life. And, and life is, in, is more important than sport. And what we've got to be very careful of, I think, with all sports is, is not rushing and jumping the gun, you know, and going back too quickly in case there's another wave of this. And we don't know yet whether this will come and go and come back again. You know, we, 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 there's no real knowing how it's going to pan out over the, over the next few months. And while we're all grieving over our sport being lost and everything, sport will come back at some point and we will all enjoy it again at some point and, and the competition will be great again at some point. The main thing is now to protect the you know, so many lives already lost. We've got to we've got to make safety the paramount issue, and that's that's even more the case when this thing hopefully bottoms out and 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 we do get close to starting again. The you know the safety measures have got to be fantastic. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, it's a bit of a somber note to finish on, but uh, it's good to see you, Rich. Anyway, uh, I, hope, I hope you keep busy. I bet your lawn looks fantastic now, doesn't oh. it? Never look better. Never look better. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> okay, well, uh, we'll see you again next week, same time, hopefully. Uh, to all those of you watching on both Facebook and YouTube, we hope you enjoyed the first of this new series of Subsbench, and that you'll join us again at the same time next week. And if you want to get in touch, uh, do feel free to either post on uh, YouTube or Facebook or send us an email to subsbenchbristol at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. We might even give you a mention on next week's show. But for the moment, from Richard and me, thanks for watching, and cheerio.